Hey guys, we're doing a first impressions video on the two Sailor Moon Eternal movies which came out on Netflix at the time of recording last weekend. I watched them both back to back and I watched them in Japanese with English subtitles because that's generally how I watch my anime. And I thought instead of committing a massive amount of time of like comparing and contrasting, I just give like an initial first impressions and I will do a like intensive video, maybe at another stage because I'm actually, I've got a bunch of videos in the pipeline that I would like to get to that aren't Sailor Moon focused, but I might do that eventually. But for now, I just thought I would talk about what I thought of the movies having watched them uh, at this time, maybe like a day ago, I think it was. If you haven't been keeping up with Sailor Moon in recent years or you're not into the Sailor Moon fandom, which I don't know why you'd be watching this, but hello. Sailor Moon had a, I don't want to say reboot. Okay, so you probably only know about the 90s anime and the 90s anime was premiering at the exact same time as the manga was premiering and much like Full Metal Alchemist's first season, the anime for Sailor Moon in the 90s had extreme differences compared to how the manga was and for the past 25 plus years the Sailor Moon fans have been asking for a manga faithful adaptation of Sailor Moon and in 2014 they launched Sailor Moon Christmas which was supposed to be a manga exact adaptation of the story and it was much maligned because the animation quality was completely in the garbage for various reasons which are too long to go into here other than the anime industry is complete garbage in terms of how they pay their animators and such so Toei who owns both Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball Z. Sailor Moon is one of their biggest money makers. It brings in 3 billion with a B. I can't remember if it's yen or dollars, but like per year. So they were rebooting or remaking or whatever you want to call it, one of their flagship franchises, and they gave it an extremely poor slipshod job. It didn't look very good. It had like bare basic effort put into it and to make matters worse, even though it was a manga accurate adaptation, it had extreme pacing issues, not because that's what you get if you try and adapt a manga directly, but it was extremely poorly handled, it had poor direction, there were things that were in the manga which were just not put into the adaptation whatsoever and it just it was not working and it was left in the state for about two seasons and because it was so badly received when season three came along they had a complete revamp in terms of style and they tried to improve it and they tried to make it better i'm guessing the blu-ray sales were not as good as they were hoping it would be so they decided to actually put effort into it but by that stage the damage was kind of already done and even though season 3 was a vast improvement from the previous two seasons it was still not the best job of adaptation. So then Toei announced that for the fourth season they instead of doing a TV series like a 26 episode TV series they were going to condense the entire season slash arc of the story into two movies and that was supposed to come out in 2019 and then the pandemic happened and it was pushed back and the first movie came out in January of 2021 in Japan and the second movie came out in February and now it's the well today is the 8th of June but on the 6th of June the movies were released internationally on Netflix. So about the story itself, the story that's being adapted in these movies is the dreams arc. I am going to try and stop myself from referring to it as Super S because that's what the anime refers to it as and I'm, I'm always more focused on the original anime than I am the manga, although I have read the manga all the way through. And here's the thing. In the 90s anime, Super S, the fourth season, the dreams arc story is the I don't want to say worse because that makes it sound very bad, but compared to the other seasons, it is the worst quote-unquote season of the Sailor Moon anime because it focuses on Chibiusa, it focuses on an extremely uncomfortable romantic relationship between her and a horse, which sounds like I'm making it up, but I'm not. 
And even if you look at it within context where it's like, well, the, the horse, the Pegasus is only an illusion portrayed by a much older male character to form a connection with the underaged girl. It sounds like I'm pushing a narrative here, but it is an extremely uncomfortable season to watch. And I have many questions as to why Ikuhara did the season this way, but that's one part of it. The other part of it is the MacGuffin of the season is to pull out people's dream mirrors and then the bad guys would stick their heads in the dream mirrors to look for Pegasus. And it was portrayed on purpose like um, assault. Again, I'm not sure why Ikuhara decided to do this, but here we are. But So, so the anime season Super S is not... It's it's the worst of the five seasons, but as I said, these movies are an adaptation of the manga. They're not an adaptation or reboot of the original 90s show. But here's the thing, even in its original form of the manga, the dreams arc is at best messy. I actually don't mind the dreams arc in the manga. I remember when I read the manga the first time, I was dreading the dreams arc. And reading the manga, I'm like, oh, this is handled so much better than the 90s anime. But even though the manga and thereby the manga story is much better than how the 90s anime interpreted the story, it is still a very messy season. Part of the reason for this is because I believe if I recall, Naoko Takeuchi actually wanted to end her Sailor Moon story at the end of the Infinity arc, which is the previous season. She was intending to end the story afterwards, but it got renewed or something. Again, I don't have any of the information in front of me because it's a first impressions video and I refuse to do like intensive research just to get my thoughts out there. But she intended for the Infinity arc to be the finale, if I recall correctly. So because it was not, the Dreams arc was a lot of floundering on her part, I feel, of trying to work out what she wanted to do with the story next. And I think it very much shows in the writing itself. Because even though it's not that the ideas in the writing is bad, it's just there's so much thrown at the wall in the manga that... It's like she should have stuck with maybe two or three of these ideas and developed them, but instead she kept pushing and adding more ideas and it makes for a very messy story. And now it's like 25 plus years later and the Sailor Moon fans are begging for a manga accurate adaptation. Toei is at a position where they have to adapt the manga accurately, but they also cannot improve on any of the parts of the story that were not fully developed because they would get eaten alive by the fans and if they did that then the fans would still not get the manga accurate adaptation of the story that they've been asking for for 25 plus years. So it's kind of messy to then say okay we're going to take the dreams arc and this is the arc in the Sailor Moon manga that we are going to turn into a full feature film and I am fully convinced that making this entire arc into movies instead of a TV show was a cost cutting measure because Toei as I said, they have been treating this franchise rather badly in terms of this adaptation. They've tried to course correct through various ways. They've asked Tadano to come back and do the character designs. Tadano did the initial Sailor Moon character designs in 1992 for the 90s anime. And I think a big part of asking her to come back was to try and repair the reputation of the show with the older fans or the casual fans who are like, we don't like that this is different. And I think that was a right move, not so much because, oh, but it's different, I don't like different, but mostly because I feel that the art direction of the previous three seasons were, first of all, not very good in the case of season one and season two, and in season three, it was a little bit too much like Precure, which people were not really enjoying. It went on to make Sailor Moon Crystal look very generic. It didn't really have an identity of its own. So they asked Todanok to come back. I do feel that making it two movies was a cost-cutting measure. It was not because they wanted to take the Dreams arc and give it a full feature film quality and feel to it. And I think because it is the least popular of the five arcs, that again they decided to do it with the Dreams arc because they knew it already had this reputation of being lesser than the other arcs. So I, maybe I'm just very cynical, but that's how I feel. I've been talking for like almost 12 minutes here on my recording, so let me try and actually talk about the movie themselves. 
The first thing that caught me really of God is that there's no intro musical sequence and I know it's a movie, it's not a TV show. However, the other three Sailor Moon movies from the 90s, they more or less had an intro sequence. I can't remember if the third one had, but I know for a fact the first and second one. Neither of the Eternal movies have any sort of musical introduction, which I mean is fine, that's not how movies work. However, because this is Sailor Moon and you know, we're all hyped up, we want to hear Moonlight Densetsu, we want to have the big flashy intro even if it's a movie. That's not here, and that's a bit of a letdown, but also it kind of leads to a bit of a cold open, I would say, where the story just kind of starts, <laughs> is the best way I can put it. It just starts, and you're like, oh, okay, here we go, I guess. Um, all right, let's go. So the first movie starts with Chibiusa kind of setting the scene so that we know where we are in the story. She says she's going back to the 30th century, and she mentions that Usagi has gotten into high school. And immediately I was kind of like tilting my head at this, not because of anything she said, but because we we're about less than a minute in. And they show that very, very, very famous panel reproduction where they used it in the 90s anime, it's in the manga, and now they've reused it here. And it was in almost every single trailer for this movie where it shows Usagi and her friends. Now in the manga, that's a very nice moment where Usagi is very, very happy that she's gotten into high school with the rest of her friends, that she passed her entrance exams. And here, that very iconic panel is just kind of thrown in there and moved on very quickly, which kind of makes me wonder if the only reason that scene is even included is so that Toei could put it in the trailer because Sailor Moon fans know that image so well. It's very strangely handled and it does come across as a little cynical. And then what happens next is we have the introduction of the story and there's like little things that I could comment on, like I'm not entirely sure why Usagi isn't with her friends. I'm not entirely sure where her friends are in the opening scene. I'm not sure, where are they? What are they doing? And there's things like they view the eclipse while they're kind of standing around in the middle of Juban. And again, in the, in the I'm going to try not making too many comparisons to the 90s anime, but in the 90s anime, when the, when the full eclipse happens, it's an event, they're going to a park where they're handing out those special eclipse viewing glasses and such to view the eclipse. It's an entire event around the eclipse. Here it's like, it's a full eclipse and people are just kind of wandering around their normal business and then they look at the eclipse for a few seconds and then they move on. And it's like, that's not how people work. You know, there was an eclipse, a partial eclipse a few years ago. Uh, in the northern hemisphere and people lost their shit you know people went out they had big parties they had massive viewings it it's just it's so bizarre and again this wouldn't be such a big problem but the start of the movie is like Shibuyusa tells us she's going home today and she tells us Yusagi has gotten into high school and now we're in the park and oh look the eclipse is happening. Oh we're having a vision of Pegasus, me and Yusagi. Oh Mamoru saw it too. Oh wait Mamoru's chest is hurting. Wait is that a circus coming to town? Oh well, I guess nobody else saw it. Let's go home because Chibiusa can't go home today. Oh look here are the kaleidoscopes on the way home. We are less than three minutes into this movie and we have just steamrolled through all of the setup at such a pace I'm like you're sitting there you're like wait hold on wait wait no wait hold on wait wait no wait hold on and it's just it's just going it's like no 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 we can't pause we gotta keep going we gotta keep going we have to put the setup here so we can get the movie started we can't spend any amount of time on any of these things we have to keep going and it's 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 such an overload and I know the story I can't imagine what it must be like to watch this if if this is your first exposure to the story I, ugh, you must be like so gobsmacked by all these events happening in such quick succession and this was kind of something I was a little afraid of when I heard that they were going to put an entire arc into two movies. I'm like, how are you going to pace this? Because even though the manga less happens in the manga because it doesn't have 50 episodes to cover, it still has enough time to give these characters some moments to breathe and allow certain events to happen and have the characters like reflect on it to a certain degree. Whereas this movie, it gets better near the end, but it just, it it's really like you're reading the cliff notes of a book rather than reading the book itself. It's like they've condensed the entire chapter of a novel down to a two word sentence and then you move on. I can't help but feel that if Toei actually put money towards this thing, what they should have done, the entire first movie, 
should have been a let's say eight nine episode anime tv series and then the second movie can be the finale to the tv series that's one way they could have done this better and it would have been structured a little easier but you know hindsight is 2020 so here we are i guess Anyway, so everything happens extremely quickly and Pegasus comes down and uh, I'm trying to remember because it, it's such a blur. I'm not joking when I say they run through so much information so quickly. So we get the setup that the Dead Moon Circus has come to town and we've got the introduction of Pegasus who's looking for a fair maiden with a beautiful dream. And we get the setup that Mamoru is feeling a little sick. And we get the other scene she reacting to the arrival of Dead Moon Circus with some trepidation. And I do want to give props to this. I see tarot cards used in movies so often where they will use the death card as like some sort of ill omen when that's not what it means. So I actually highly appreciate this movie using the moon card instead, which, you know, it's kind of cute, a Sailor Moon and all that. But again, they actually bothered to use a card that more accurately represents the situation rather than just using <gasps> the death card and it's just I, I'm so sick of that trope so that made me happy. We then cut to Usagi and Chibiusa staying over at Mamoru's place. I do appreciate the part where Mamoru tries to kick Usagi out because he says it'll reflect badly on him if his, if his teenage girlfriend is staying over. Um, which, you know, good on him. The, the age difference is an entire topic on its own. At least here, they're only, I think they're only two or three years apart versus the 90s anime. But again, let's not even go into that because that is an entire topic onto itself. So here we have a, a deeper look into Chibiusa's character. And this is the part of the dreams arc in the manga I actually really like. Because like I said, I don't enjoy 90s anime Chibiusa at all. I think she is really unlikable. In the manga, she is actually very likable. And they do bring across why I like her in the manga in this part. But again, because they're steamrolling through so much of the material so quickly, the parts that make Chibiusa likable, I feel they're a little downplayed, not because they're removed or whatever, but just because those moments in the manga feel really poignant, whereas here it feels like they've got a checklist of every plot point they have to hit, and the only reason these scenes are included in the anime is because they exist in the manga. And what it is, is it's Chibiusa admitting to herself that she really looks up to Usagi, and what Chibiusa wants to do is she wants to grow up to be the kind of person Usagi is, both physically, but I think also more importantly, that Usagi is a person that all the other characters look towards as the person that they protect and stuff. I don't want to say leader because Minako is the leader, but it is leader, but it's not in terms of like the person who gives orders. It's just, you know, she's the princess. A again, there's probably a better way to describe it, but... Chibiusa really looks up to Usagi and that's what she wants to be, which I feel is a big part of the story of the Dreams arc and it's a part of the story which I feel should have been the core focus of the story, but unfortunately that story kind of takes a back seat the further we go along into the plot and the story of the Dreams arc focuses in more on Usagi and Mamoru's romantic relationship, whereas Again, I feel the heart of the story should have been Chibiusa's reconciliation with herself that even though she is not Sailor Moon, she is not the person that um, uplifts everyone around her and that everybody looks towards, she has value in of herself and also the fact that just because she is not that person at this current time, that is something that she can aspire to and grow up to try and be. That should have been the focus of this arc because this is called the Dreams arc. And although it does deal with things like nightmares being a big part of the bad guys in the story, the Dreams arc's biggest focus is on the dreams and aspirations of its characters. Like what they want to work towards in their future lives. And because Chibiusa is the youngest member of the team, her desire to grow up into somebody that she admires like Usagi, she wants to grow up to be a lady, that to me should have been one of the driving forces of the arc, which I think it was intended to be, but just something in the way the plot is structured ends up being kind of a B-plot rather than the sole focus, and I think that's a real shame. 
because I feel the material here is probably some of the strongest in the arc. For instance, one of the big important plot points is Pegasus says that he is looking for a beautiful maiden with a beautiful dream who is bathed in moonlight and is a princess and carries the silver crystal. Now the thing is, he first comes to Chibiusa and she is very happy to be perceived in this way, but she eventually either realizes or decides that Usagi is the person that Pegasus is looking for, and she even has the maturity to call Pegasus and say to him that she is not the maiden he's looking for, he's looking for Usagi, something that extremely deeply hurts her because she wishes she could be a person with that level of importance. She still says, no, I'm not the person you're looking for. And then it is up to Helios, who is Pegasus's human form, or his real form, it's, it's Helios. Helios has to console her and let her know that she has value, like she has value towards not just the team, but as a person. And he kind of lets her know that just because she is not Sailor Moon, she is a completely irreplaceable part of other people's lives and again I feel that should have been the main focus of the story but instead it's kind of a B plot that's mostly covered in the first movie and then pushed aside for the rest of the story. Again there are so many ideas battling for attention in the dreams arc that I feel that some of the casualties of what could have been really really good core focuses of the story are lost in the process and I think it's a real shame. And this is why I said an adaptation of the Dreams arc is kind of messy because once again, like I said, you've got this problem of there are these core ideas that could be developed into really, really good, strong stories. But we are at a point where Toei is trying to do a manga accurate adaptation of the story. And if they um, deviate from that, they are going to get a lot of hate and anger from the fan base who are waiting for a manga accurate adaptation of the story. So you're in this catch-22 where you can't take these ideas and develop them to their full potential because you are trying to make an adaptation that focuses on adapting this beat by beat. And as a result, you have a end story that is just as messy as the manga. However, because you're also doing it within a confined time frame, you've got so much time to work with. A lot of it also gets pushed aside because you have to decide what you want to include without cutting any of it. So you just have to shorten the amount of focus something gets rather than removing it completely. And it makes for a movie that it's not a train smash but the pacing is an issue. Again, it gets better in the second movie but I'll talk about that in a second or two. The art design and the character design that Tadano has provided does make the characters much more appealing to look at. and. Part of that may be nostalgia on my part, even though I didn't watch Sailor Moon as a child. I think I saw Sailor Moon, well, I don't know, I had the movies when I was 13, so maybe. But even if it is nostalgia, I just feel that Tadano's character design is much stronger than the previous character designs. It could just simply be due to the fact that she has more experience with character design. But for whatever reason, the characters do look very good in this adaptation. However, as somebody where, again, I really like the 90s anime, the expressiveness and the range of emotions that the characters show in the 90s anime are not as present in this adaptation. And again, it might be because it's leaning on the manga, and there are cartoony bits here and there, but it all feels really, um, this is gonna sound strange, it, it, it comes across as performative. It comes across as the reason the characters are very expressive in this part of the story is because in the manga that's the way this panel is drawn. And it's a bit of a shame because the characters come across as a lot more lifeless uh, than I've seen them in the past. And I'm busy watching Hot Catch Precure for the first time, so it's a big shame to go from that and the way those characters express themselves to this, where even though every single character looks very pretty to look at and, and every frame of this movie is very beautiful, it still lacks soul on some level in terms of the characters themselves. I don't know. This might just be a me thing. And like I said, I've been watching another anime that is much more expressive. But it was something that I noted while watching this. I don't know if you're a fan of the manga and you're not a fan of the original anime. If you would have a problem with this. But it is something I marked upon. 
That being said, the, this, this movie and the second one especially, they're very, very good to look at. They're really gorgeous. They do this thing where they use a bokeh effect whenever you could tell the shoujo bubbles in the manga would appear. They actually recreate that in the anime movie using bokeh and I think that's how you say it, bokeh. But it comes across as really good looking and the scenes where you see Tokyo and Juban from the sky during Chibiusa's flight is really good looking as well. The only downside is because of the way the art direction works in this movie and the previous Crystal Seasons, that iconic look that the original 90s anime had for Tokyo is not present in this movie whatsoever. You don't have any of those colors or any of that stylization, you just have scenes of Tokyo and Jubon which are really really good and really pretty but if I removed them from this movie and showed them to you, you would not be able to say they came from Sailor Moon you would just recognize them as nice anime scenery. I'm not so sure how big of a problem or thing worth noting that is. It's just something that I noticed and in the back of my head I was just like, oh well that's a shame, and then moved on. So I noticed it, but it's not like I got hung up on it. It was just like, oh I remember the backgrounds, they used to be very nice. These are pretty, but that's all they are, is pretty. The uh, uh, Sailor Moon reboot still has no idea how to draw cats though. They have, they have no idea how to draw cats. I don't understand this. We know that Japan has cats in it. Why Why is it so hard for them to draw a cat? Why are they so incompetent at it? it it's, it's, more, it's more hilarious than anything else at this stage. It's just this is a continuous problem and they still haven't gotten it right. You now have presumably a movie budget, but you still haven't gotten this correct. But okay. Speaking of which, and speaking of movie budget, even though this looks much better than the previous three seasons, and I do enjoy the post-production effects that they put on certain frames and such, nothing in this movie makes me think that it is a theatrical film, because it was out theatrically in Japan. It was a roadshow movie, if I remember correctly. I'm not entirely sure how the roadshow movies work in Japan, but it did come out in theaters. But if I were to look at these screenshots, they just look like a very nice TV anime. I can't say that these frames and this movie looks any better than anime that was made for television. And again, if you look at theatrical anime movies from the 90s, if you compare the theatrical Sailor Moon movies compared to the television Sailor Moon anime, you can immediately see the massive jump in quality, not only in how the characters move, but also just in the cinematography. And maybe that's part of that is because you're jumping from a 4x5 aspect ratio to a 9x16. But it's just there is a very clear difference between the much higher theatrical films versus the television. Whereas this, I can't say that watching these movies that I could immediately say, oh no, these are absolutely theatrical movies. You can just tell by the quality that this is a theatrical movie. I can't really say that. It just looks like a good looking TV show to me, quite frankly. I'm not, I don't know, maybe you guys would disagree, but that's also something that I felt I wanted to remark on because I thought it was a shame. They included a lot of things which I feel they honestly could have left out, not because they're bad or such, just because I don't think they really suit the story or benefit the story in any kind of way. But as I said, it's so dedicated to following the manga step by step and not leaving a single thing out that you have things where it, it's the only reason it's in the movie is because it's in the manga. Like, they keep in the part where Chibiusa and Usagi switch ages, which is a very confusing part of the story where I don't really see it having any reason for happening. In the 90s anime this happens as well and it doesn't make much more sense there either and in some ways is a lot worse because when adult-bodied Chibiusa talks to Pegasus, he tells her they can't be together anymore because she's not a child anymore. <laughs> Again, I, I, I don't like this season in the 90s anime. <laughs> Which brings up the question, uh, do I prefer these movies or do I prefer the 90s anime? And I know that's a statement one should actually leave for the end of a discussion like this, but because I don't really want to talk about the 90s anime too much despite doing that a lot, it's difficult because I think the movies overall are better. It doesn't have the lows that the 90s anime does, but it doesn't have the highs either. So 
it's one of those things where it doesn't have the best parts of the Super S season, but it also doesn't have the worst parts of the Super S season, so I don't know, it, it's kind of like, pick your poison, I suppose. But at the very least, we don't have scenes of Chibiusa talking to Pegasus in secret and him telling her, oh, you can't tell anyone that we're having these meetings. And then when she shows up with the body of an adult, he's like, oh, I can't see you anymore. And she just, she starts crying and that's why she turns back into a child. Like none of that is in the movies. So thank heavens we can just skip all that weirdness because I have no idea what's going on over there. But they do keep in the plot point where Chibiusa and Usagi switch ages, which I don't know if Naoko just included that because she wanted to draw Chibiusa as an adult. It could be. She does things like that quite a bit in the manga where she'll just do something because she wanted to draw something. I saw somebody once make the joke that the only reason she made Chibiusa is because she wanted a child model to draw cute children's clothes because she couldn't do that with any of the other cast. Which I don't think is true, but at the same time... I can't completely write it off either. It is likely up to a point. Anyway, that whole, I can't even call it a plot point. That whole small scene is in the movies, despite the fact that it doesn't make any sense and doesn't serve the story in any way, shape or form, and is done away with and fixed just as weirdly and out of nowhere as it happens. So I guess we get to see cute child Usagi, at least in like her short ponytails. That's something, I suppose. And it also helps that Helios is drawn and portrayed as still maybe a little older than Chibiusa, but it's not this weird dynamic of him feeling like an adult and her a child. I don't know, it just, it doesn't feel as weird and out of place. Oh, that being said though, I do wish that this movie did not follow the manga with such dedication that they copied the fact that Pegasus's design very clearly shows that Naoko Takushi doesn't know how to draw a horse. And instead of drawing a horse properly, the anime movie decided to draw Pegasus badly because that's the way Naoko draws him because she can't draw horses. <laughs> There's so much of that here. It's like it's so dedicated to replicating the manga to such a degree where it's like warts and all and a lot of it, it's very strange to me. But I guess that's a different way of saying like, oh, well, it has the strengths of the manga, but it also has the shortfalls of the manga. Uh, some of it is very strange to me. The other thing I want to comment on that was driving me crazy, and this isn't anything to do with the movie itself, it's to do with Netflix's subtitles. Whoever did the subtitles and translation for these movies kept referring to the small monster creatures as Lemures and the reason they did that is because I think they were they were listening to what the word in the name is in the anime and they were just writing it out phonetically like Lemuris but these things they're called Remless R-E-M-less like you know like rapid eye movement sleep which is what happens when you have dreams and this is the dreams arc they're they're Remless they're the dreamless what is this Lemuris like who this is a professional subtitling job. This is somebody who was paid to subtitle and translate this. Like, who did this? Who screwed this up? I've seen fan subs that know and understand how to do this properly. It's so strange to me. I don't have the manga in front of me. I actually want to see whether they call them Lemures or like Remless in the manga. Again, it, it's what they're saying. It, it, if you listen to how they say the word, yes, it's with the Japanese accent, but that's literally what they're saying. Remless. Lemuris. I don't know. Netflix either needs to change that or uh, it's so frustrating and drives me crazy every single time I saw it. The Amazon trio is in the movie. I knew we wouldn't get fisheye to the degree that we do in the 90s anime because even though the Amazon trio and their weird like assault mirrors are some of the worst parts of the 90s anime, fisheye and their eventual eventual comeuppance is also one of the best things in the 90s anime and I knew that fisheye was not going to get the character development that he does in the original and I didn't expect any of them to because frankly manga Usagi has zero chill like if you compare anime Usagi to like manga Usagi I, I just knew that they were going to they weren't going to treat this character with the nuance and with the backstory not even backstory because there is no real backstory with the depth that this character had been given in the past few years, they were just going to undo that and just portray Fisheye and Tiger Eye and Hawk's Eye exactly as they are in the manga, which again is a bit of a shame. I think they did give Hawk's Eye a little bit more depth, 
Hawksai did give me quite a few feelings which I wasn't expecting because I really enjoyed how they portrayed his character and how they dealt with his character where when you first see Hawksai in his and I'm saying his because it's it's a little difficult to understand with the Japanese language uh, Hawksai refers to himself as Atashi which is the feminine version of I however he's saying Atashi not Watashi and this is also a way that gay men in Japan refer to themselves not just trans women so you understand it, it, it's Sailor Moon <laughs> I think every single character in this whole show is gay quite frankly so whatever but they never ever make Hawk's Eye's appearance and identity a joke or something to make fun of or that's why they're a villain and actually when uh, Mako and Chibiusa first see Hawk's Eye and they talk about him afterwards they literally just think of him as oh what a wonderful person they were so that was quite nice I actually really appreciate that they don't call much attention to it and they just move on and it's not treated as a joke or something to make fun of and it's not the typical Japanese effeminate man being the butt of a joke as you see in a lot of anime so that was quite nice the entire part with the inner senshi where every single you, you go through every single one of the inners and this is what their dream is and then they get attacked by one of the amazon trio and then they defeat them and then we move on that whole section of this also feels very episodic which is again why i feel maybe this would have worked better as a tv show and it ends on minako and because Minako goes through her mini arc of leveling up and getting her heart crystal and all of that because the epi uh, episode because the movie ends before the resolution of her coming to terms with that it feels very weird because in the second movie Minako never gets a comeuppance or an end to her story arc it's very very strange because She's feeling inadequate as the inner scene she's leader. So she goes off and does something stupid and impulsive because that's just Minako's character. And then she gets her new power. And before she can really step up and regain her confidence as the leader, because she was really down that everybody kept talking about the outer scene she and revering them. And she was like, oh, it's because I'm such a bad leader that you guys just keep talking about their leadership. And then she goes through her arc and then the bad guys attack and then the movie ends. And then... The second movie starts and we spend I think eight or nine minutes with the outer senshi before they show up, save the inner senshi and Minako kind of gets a sad expression and her entire resolution is just left out of the movie. There, There is no resolution for Minako's inferiority complex or her hurt self-esteem. They never resolve that and in fact they double down on it because her self-esteem was injured by how much the others were relying on the outers only for the outers to show up and save them. I don't know why they did it this way. It's very very strange. It's so weird. Also Minako's room in this in this movie is so bad. She looks like she lives in a prison. I... Uh, these days, okay, these days how a lot of anime work is they'll model an entire room in 3D and then when they draw the backgrounds they'll do it digitally and they'll just trace over the 3D of the room. Um, not all anime work this, a lot of anime still works on paper first, but this is like a cost cutting measure that a lot of them do. So as a result, a lot of indoor interiors in anime tend to look really stark and unappealing i've seen this i think it's the worst i've seen this is in the anime with the like the tiny mummy um character i think that's the worst i've seen it although it's also really bad in flying witch and this is how minako's room looks it's so stark and there's nothing personal about it and it's just it's even if i again i'm trying not to refer to the 90s anime but just on its own it's just bad I also have no idea why they decided Artemis should creep on her in the shower and say like how beautiful she is. That panel is actually in the manga um, if I'm just working off memory but it came across as very strange here. Um, there's one or two maybe three moments in both movies that came across as like uncomfortably horny which I, I'm not a fan. I don't know why they did it this way. I am glad, just as a side note, which has nothing really to do with anything as a complete non-sequitur, I do enjoy that they've done away with the bad habits of 
In Sailor Moon Crystal, at least the first two seasons, the Senshi would only wear color-coded clothes, like they were the Power Rangers, where even when they're in their civilian gear, they would only wear clothes that were color-coded to them. I'm glad that they've completely done away with this and they just let the characters wear the cute clothes they had in the manga, because there are some very nice outfits in the manga, and I'm just glad we're we're past the, the color-coded wardrobe. It was very boring and very hokey, and I'm just glad this movie just completely shelved that idea com like completely got rid of it because it's just it's so much better for some reason the amazon quartet which isn't the amazon trio the amazon quartet don't get the tadano eyes which is very strange and it's a little off-putting their eyes look similar to the original two seasons of sailor moon crystal i'm not sure why it was done this way especially if you know the entire lore behind the amazon quartet it's very odd i have no idea why this decision was made also, um, side note, I'm a little bit sad that they have them all at a rather light skin tone. I'm not going to push how I feel about that too hard. I just feel that it's a pity they could have darkened the skin tone, but I think that's a larger problem over anime at all. We've gotten to the point where characters, even light skinned characters, are so light skinned that if you use the eyedropper tool, it literally looks like white. And there is an entire discussion I once did on Tumblr talking about the uncanny valley effect to do with modern day anime. Maybe I'll. Make, I'll just like read that out and turn it into a video at some point anyway that's also it kind of adds to the designs being a little off in terms of color but it's just one the tadano eyes and the lacking of it is very strange to me there's a lot of decisions here that are very strange to me i'm realizing as i'm talking it is nice just to finally see a lot of characters in anime form even if they're not really explained or given their proper context a lot of people have been waiting to see some of these characters in an animated form, like Human Artemis was one I've really been wanting to see for a long time. All the human cats actually, apart from Luna, because we had her in the movie. But seeing the, the cats as humans was very nice, I was very happy to see that. It was very nice to see Phobos and Deimos in their human forms, which is really nice, even though they didn't really explain the significance of those characters. But they're here at least, we can point at them and go, oh look, finally we've got them in anime form, which I think is the reason why they were included, just to kind of satisfy the fans. But it's the kind of fan service where I can't even be angry about it, because to include it for reasons of, oh, that's what the fans want to see, I mean, they're right we want to see that so. so it's nice to have that here even if the context is completely removed as uh, hey, at least it's here the henshins of all the characters are all a combination of copying the original henshins transformation scenes from the 90s anime but they've added little bits of extra to it which i really like i absolutely hate the transformation sequences from the previous seasons of crystal like all of them i hate them they're so over the top and done badly. I'm actually going to make a video about Magical Girl transformation sequences and which ones I feel are good and which ones I feel are bad. And I don't think I'm going to include Sailor Moon too much there because I talk about Sailor Moon too much as it is, but I vastly prefer the hybrid transformations in the movies where they've both updated it while also being true to the originals. As well as they've done this with the attacks as well where they've upgraded the attacks where it does use some animation footage from the original 90s, but they've added things or they've updated it it looks really good i really enjoy it and i actually enjoy the changes they've made to it too aqua rhapsody i think was a director favorite or something because aqua rhapsody looks so good in this movie it's completely reanimated and it just it looks gorgeous i'm very excited to see how they do ami's attack from stars when they eventually get to stars because she only had that in one small mini theatrical short and we never got to see that in the anime i'm actually excited for all the stars attacks that's going to be really good to see because they don't really have the stars attacks in the 90s anime so it'll be completely new and that's gonna be fun that being said though i don't know what's up with this face that ray makes when she powers up and she gets her new attack uh in looking for footage for the magical Girl transformations video i want to do i've been getting a lot of footage from corrector yui which is a really fun magical girl show because it's a girl who is a magical girl with the powers of the internet like it's internet themed magical girl it's really great but unfortunately in corrector yui there's a lot of horny face going on when she transforms and Ray kind of does the same thing when she gets her powers. It's very strange and I'm not entirely sure why it's here. I think, I don't know, it, it's it's odd. It, it's, it makes me raise my eyebrow. I don't know why this is here. Also, I know I already talked about the fact that this anime has no way, it doesn't know how to draw cats, but I really need to point out the worst cat animation I've ever seen in my life. Like, I just need to show you guys this. Just, look at this, look at this. Okay, we can move on. I, you guys just had to see that because I was in disbelief. What? 
We also see Ami's mom, which I said in the previous video, we have never seen in anime form. Well, no, we did. We saw the back of her head in the Super S movie for like one still frame. But it's actually really nice to see Ami's mom. And I really like her design. She's really, really nicely designed. I have no idea if she was designed by Tadano or if Naoko Takeuchi came and did some character designs for the movie or if it was com somebody else completely. But whoever designed Ami's mom did a really excellent job. I really enjoy this design here. I also really like the discussions that form the majority of both movies with like a proper setup in the first movie and a proper payoff in the second movie regarding Usagi and Mamoru's relationship where Mamoru is fretting that because he's not as powerful as Sailor Moon he frets that he kind of just holds her back and at the same time she frets that she's always dragging him into very dangerous situations. I really enjoyed that this was a thread throughout both movies and that it's one of the things in the movies that they properly paid attention to in the first movie and then they developed and then in the second movie they paid it off and they paid it off in the climax of the movie that was one of the through lines in the movies and again if this these movies had a little less going on i feel that would have come across stronger but i really enjoyed that and i actually don't remember that in the manga it might have been there and i just didn't pay as much attention to it because romance is not my major focus on most things however mutual respect and communication is absolutely my favorite thing to see in any kind of romance writing so i really appreciate it here it might be in the manga and I just don't remember it, but I don't know if it was focused on as heavily as it is here, so that's that's really cool. They toned down the violence as they've been doing a lot throughout Crystal, which I'm not a gore hound. Well, no, I can't even say I'm not a gore hound. I'm a big fan of horror. Okay, I don't want Sailor Moon to be a grimdark, gory anime, but when Artemis gets crushed by the boulder, they don't even shake the camera. It's the most lukewarm, limp, violent scene in the entire movie, and it's it's given no gravitas whatsoever. They don't even they don't even move the camera, so it feels like this big nothing where it's this massive dramatic beat in the manga, and they've just they've completely toned it down. I guess I mean I can't blame them. I guess crushing a cat with a boulder is a little bit extreme, but it again you're doing the manga to such a dedicated extreme into terms of how accurate you want to portray it but then you tone down the violence it's like go all the way or go home don't don't half ass it in the places where it makes you uncomfortable that being said i do appreciate how they found a compromise with the sickness that mamoru and usagi have where when they start coughing up blood and stuff it's not done to an extreme but they didn't completely remove it they actually left it into the story but they didn't make it as gory and violent and upsetting as they could have the manga is all throughout the manga the manga is actually really violent i think people who haven't read the manga don't realize this the sailor moon manga has quite a bit of really shocking violence in it and I don't mind them downplaying some of it in the anime, but like I said, with the scene of Artemis, it completely just removes the drama. It's meant to be this massively dramatic moment and it's just completely like neutered. So I am glad that with the sickness, they left it in and they managed to do it in a way where they turned it down without completely removing it from the story or removing why it's important or dramatic. I, I really enjoyed how they balanced that. So speaking of part two, Part 2 is very strange because, as I said, in part 1, they try and do all the setup for the movie in like the first 3 minutes, 4 minutes tops. But then when part 2 starts, we spend about 8 minutes with the outer senshi and Hotaru. And... Okay. So the Sailor Moon manga has always had this aspect to it where it feels very non-Euclidean. And the second movie especially really captures that feeling where non-Euclidean is the only way I can describe it. That's the only term in English I can use to properly explain the feeling that the manga has where the, the backgrounds and the setup and the setting of where the characters physically are feels very dreamlike, very hazy. And I'm not, I don't mean like dreamlike in when they're in dreams or when they're in an illusion. I mean like the physical places that the characters inhabit always seem very hazy or unreal. The second movie especially really captures this, but it also means sometimes that you, you don't feel completely grounded in where the characters are. I don't think that's a problem. I just think it's an aspect of the story and in a way I'm kind of glad they managed to adapt that into an animated form because it's one of Sailor Moon's aesthetics in the manga that we've never really had outside of the manga. PGSM you're not going to have that at all because you're dealing with live actors but the Sailor Moon anime all the characters feel very grounded in the reality that they inhabit and 
the second movie part two is where it really goes into that dreamy haze like feeling that the entirety of the manga has which i quite like but as i was saying with the outers you spend a lot of time with the outers and hotaru and it has that non-euclidean feel to it but at the same time i don't understand why the outers were giving the eight nine minutes of setup when the first movie didn't give that same amount of time to the inners and Usagi. And I don't know if that might be a bias on the, the studio's terms, or if it's because Toei is very aware of the fact that the outer senshi are extremely popular. So it was kind of a way to placate fans because they, they bait the outers at the end of the first part where they have like a Marvel movie stinger at the end of the credits to show, oh, next time we're getting to the outers. And then the second movie starts and we spend eight minutes with the outers before we get a conclusion to Minako's emotional arc. It's more important we spend time with Michiru, Haruka and Setsuna and Hotaru and they're little like domestic AU where they're all living in the little lesbian cottage together and their thruple and their adopted daughter. We spent eight minutes on that. You know, Minako's getting strangled by a plant, but no time for that. We have to talk about the fact that Hotaru has been reading Yates poetry. Again, some very strange choices in these movies. But I do feel part two is where the majority of the budget went because part two, yes, part one has the nice shoujo sparkles and some really gorgeous drawings, but part two has some incredible sakuga, like really nice movement and the the general uptick in quality is extremely remarkable like you can immediately tell that the quality has jumped up quite a few paces and all the pacing issues that i've complained about in part one those are completely gone part two is such a strong good movie on its own it's it's just i don't want to say it's night and day because it's not really that big a contrast but the problems i had with part one a lot of the things i complained about regarding pacing and confusing decisions a lot of that is gone in part two part two to me is just the better structured movie of the two and i'm not just talking in terms of superficial things i'm talking about the foundational construction of the movie itself is done better in part two than it is in part one which i think is good because you know part two has the climax of the story it's more important to nail a climax than it is to get the beginning done properly and that's something in everything you know you can have a kind of shitty start to a story as long as you end the story very well because the ending is what's going to stick with people and that's true of all stories and we've seen that when people botch the ending such as just for an example game of thrones game of thrones was supposedly this extremely strong magnificent television in terms of television show in terms of storytelling but because the ending was botched so badly everybody's just kind of disowned it as a television television show people have completely dropped it and dropped interest in it and it's because the ending was bad and that's just the way it is so them putting their focus on getting the second part of the two movies correct i'm not going to complain about that at all and i think the first part does have a lot of manga panel recreations but i think part two has some manga panel recreations where i have such a visual memory that there are certain points where i can point at the screen and go oh yes it's that panel i know that panel which was nice to see. It's not something to complain about at all. There's some gorgeous imagery in this movie. It looks so good. When they do introduce Nehelenia visually on screen, it does feel a bit of a like a coupon shot. If you don't know what a coupon shot is, it's from Red Letter Media. I'll insert the clip here of, I think it's Rich Evans who explains what the coupon shot is. Because when you see that alien costume in full body, it looks like a guy in a suit. But they do yeah. the best to like shoot around it, cut yeah. around it, make it look like it's... Shoot it from the right angles, it yeah. looks good. But they also had the reveal. Oh. Yeah. They unwrapped the present for us. Yes. In, in Carnosaur, they basically threw a gift certificate at us. Yeah. That was... That <laughs> was 20 bucks to Starbucks. Yeah. Bomb. <laughs> <laughs> from that close, too, just like... Yeah, there you go. The coupon shot. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And that's kind of how I feel they dealt with Nehelenia's introduction visually because she's in the shadows in the first movie and then they properly introduce her in the second movie but she's kind of just like, oh there she is. Which is a shame because Nehelenia is one of my favorite villains in the 90s anime. I really adore the nine or ten episode mini arc she got at the beginning of stars i think it's some of the strongest storytelling in all of sailor moon it's completely not here in the movies but i didn't expect it to be because that was one of those weird things where they were waiting for the manga to update so that they could continue the story so they kind of had to make up a story to fill the time and it's just it's so excellently done in the 90s anime 
And in this movie, she's she's Maleficent. Okay, Nehalenia is Maleficent. That's it. And the concepts that the movie and manga introduce in terms of Nehalenia being the dark side of the moon, quite literally, it's hinted at and mentioned, but nothing is done with it. It's like the concept is there and the idea is there, but it's never followed through upon. It's just, it's there. The movie does, however, talk a lot about the light attracts darkness as darkness attracts light, which I feel is discussed a lot more in stars in the manga than it is in the dreams arc, which makes me wonder how they're going to handle doing stars because the way this movie is structured, it's very clear to me that they are definitely going to do the stars arc because they're introducing concepts and things such as that in this movie already such as the whole darkness attracts light as light attracts darkness that is essentially the entire final argument of stars is the discussion of good and evil and the balance of them between and how if you destroy one you end up with uh, what's the word words are escaping me today entropy that's the word so the Sailor Stars arc talks a lot about darkness attracting light and light attracting darkness and destroying one leads to nothing but entropy but in order to have goodness you have to have darkness you have to have evil and you have to accept the fact that those two things means that existence will always be in a state of conflict but to undo the one would just put everything in a static state where it's just entropy and nothing moves forward. Those are the ideas that the Sailor Stars manga arc talk about. Some of that is getting set up in this movie, so it says to me that they are going to do Sailor Stars. Um, because I wasn't entirely sure if they would, simply because they did the Dreams arc as two movies rather than a TV show. So I actually wasn't sure whether they were going to do Stars or if they were kind of just testing whether it's worth their time and money to do so by doing Dreams as two movies and then depending on how good the movies did they'll decide whether or not to do stars or not but it seems with the setups they're putting here that they are intending to do stars they are going to finish the story so that's quite nice i do hope they do stars as a tv series however well, i don't know the way stars end i feel the extreme scale of how stars end it would do well as a movie We'll have to see how they decide to do it because I don't always know why Toei does the things it does, quite frankly. Toei does some strange, strange things. And I don't just mean in the context of, this, of these two movies. I mean, in general, they do extremely strange things. I haven't really talked about the plot of both movies because I feel, well, if you're interested, you should watch them. Although if you're not familiar with Sailor Moon stories at all, it's going to be very confusing. I feel this movie is very much for people who know the story. This is not a movie for people who have no exposure to Sailor Moon at all. This is not for people who have never read Sailor Moon or watched any Sailor Moon. The Sailor Moon movies from the 90s are like that. If you have not watched any Sailor Moon whatsoever, you can watch one of the three movies from the 90s to get yourself acquainted with Sailor Moon. This is not like that. These movies are very much for people who have read Sailor Moon, who have watched Sailor Moon, who already know who these characters are. It expects you to be on the same page. I think I saw somewhere that, oh no, I was about to say, I think I saw somewhere that they were going to do the second Sailor Moon movie again, but that was actually, it was the uh, stage show of it, so never mind. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm waffling here now. And since I'm waffling, I think I'm going to end it there in terms of first impressions. I think they're both okay. <laughs> I think maybe I'll like them more if I rewatch them, especially if I don't watch them back to back and I kind of only watch the second movie, which I'll probably do. I'll probably watch that one again. I don't know about the first one. It's it's very strangely paced and there's some odd decisions made in it, but I can definitely see myself watching the second one again. And as I said previously, if I had to give a final verdict, I would say it doesn't have the highs of the 90s anime. It doesn't have the lows. It is an adaptation of the Sailor Moon manga, and that is all it is. So, depending on your own feelings and your own biases and your own preferences, the fact that these movies are an adaptation of the manga, no more, no less, is what, like, it depends on you on how much that is a good or bad thing.